And so you might think for a second, well, what would be a good thing for this network to represent? What, 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 what should these individual neurons in the hidden layer, if they're doing a good job of, of kind of encoding what is out there in the world, what would they actually be encoding? What we expect a self-organizing model of this form to learn over time? Well, that's really the key question. And we can just kind of keep stepping through and see all these different input patterns that are presented to the network. And you can see for every different input pattern, just because of the random initial weights, you tend to get a different set of neurons responding. But that's not always true. Uh, sometimes the same neuron will respond twice, but because the weights are increasing, so here's a great example. Here's our, uh, our neuron that got really excited for the cross pattern. It, it got less activated by this kind of upside down T pattern, okay? And because it got less activated, it's actually gonna decrease its synaptic weights for this pattern. And this is what allows this neuron to really differentiate or specialize its synapses to, to emphasize either the, the kind of cross pattern or maybe this um, vertical pattern, we don't know, it's gonna decrease its sensitivity to this kind of underlying, uh, this bottom uh, horizontal bar pattern. And over time, as the neurons get more and less active um, in response to these different input patterns, we're gonna see that they're gonna kind of shape their responses and they're kind of jumping, jumping around uh, over time. We can kind of keep our eye on this one neuron here and run the network and see where it ends up. And you can see as we keep running that learning rule and the competition keeps shaking out, we're now training this network on many, many different input patterns over time, it very clearly ends up uh, specializing on that vertical bar. So it really unlearned uh, that, that bottom horizontal bar. It didn't even really actually stabilize that much on the cross pattern. And this is actually exactly the best way to represent this input space because it allows um, each individual neuron to pull out a, a single feature um, and it, it, if you think about it, you only need 10 such neurons, one for each vertical line and one for each horizontal line, of which there are five each, to encode the entire space of patterns. If each individual neuron instead was learning about combinations of lines, there are many more combinations of lines than individual lines. And so it's a less efficient representation if they focus on the combination of lines relative to sort of encoding each line independently. And so this efficiency of, and compactness of the representation is something that the neurons respond to and one of the ways in which we evaluate how good the self-organizing learning is. There is a certain amount of kind of tuning of the parameters that is necessary for the self-organizing learning to do the right thing. One of the things we can do to look at this is plot over time for each individual neuron um, its pattern of synaptic weights. And so again, we can see the neuron that we've been looking at originally, this, this vertical center vertical line detecting neuron is located here. This is kind of matches with the overall layout of the neurons in this hidden layer. So the outer uh, uh, grid is individual neurons in the hidden layer. And then the inner grid is the receptive field we refer to it as of the synaptic weights coming in uh, from the input layer into that particular neuron. Okay, now we're gonna see how the network uh, learns in a second time. Uh, when I hit this button, we'll get a new set of random initial weights and it will train over all those different uh, line patterns and we'll see what it ends up pulling up. Okay, in this case, just by chance that neuron ends up responding again to vertical lines. I guarantee you this is not built in, it's just random chance. If you look at the different neurons that, that got trained, you can see they each picked up on different kinds of horizontal and vertical lines. And in general, if you look through the, the overall set of synaptic weights that were learned, you can see that on average, typically the neurons are encoding each of the different elements separately. So you have the first horizontal line, next horizontal line, next horizontal line, and so, and so on. Similarly, you have the first vertical line, 
uh, the next vertical line is not as separately represented here, um, etc. So you sometimes you don't get a perfect uh, separate uh, vertical line or horizontal line represented, but a lot of times you do. And so if we just keep stepping through, um, again, according to just those random initial synaptic weights, you'll get different patterns here, uh, some more separated, some less separated. Um, but each time the result is really a, a function of the random initial weights plus this kind of learning dynamic. But each time you can see a large number of neurons really do end up pulling out these individual line features. And that's how we kind of indicate the overall success of the model. We can plot uh, over time the extent to which there is a unique activity pattern in the hidden layer for each separate line feature that, that's presented. And if we start the model over, we can just run it and it'll train multiple times uh, with different initial weights. And this kind of unique pattern statistic, the unique path st statistic, um, ends up typically uh, around 10, which means that there each of the 10 different lines is getting represented by a different unique uh, uh, pattern of activity in the hidden layer. And so that's a good measure of success. And if we look at the overall plot, we can see that across these multiple runs, in general, on average, we tend to get a unique pattern of activity. And so that indicates that the network really has specialized neurons that are responding to each of those different um, line features. So in summary, this model demonstrates that a combination of inhibitory competition positive feedback loops from the Hebbian learning, producing a rich get richer dynamic, a tuning, uh, an adaptation of the neurons for the particular patterns that tend to excite them the most, combined with this kind of homeostatic negative feedback loop that, that helps distribute the neurons more evenly across the space, all of those factors working together result in a model that self-organizes. It develops completely on its own, just as a function of the random initial weights and the activities that unfold, results in a network that emergently has done a reasonable job of encoding the information in this input space. Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead now and just show you what this chapter six version of this model looks like. We'll go into more detail with this when we when we actually get to chapter six, but I just want to give you a little preview of how these same principles that we've just been looking at extend to a more realistic case. And so in this model, we're actually looking at a bunch of different images. Uh, we looked at these in the introduction. They're images from my trip to New Zealand. Each input is processed according to a kind of on-center versus off-center. We'll go into these details later. But the key thing is that in this V1 layer that we're looking at here, you have individual neurons, again, competing through inhibitory competition, also learning strictly according to the self-organizing BCM type of Hebbian learning. And their synaptic weights are adapting uh, over time in response to these learning mechanisms. And it takes quite a bit of time for these things to develop, but we can plot uh, the initially random synaptic weights um, that you see, and this is actually subtracting the on versus the off center, you'll gradually see an overall pattern emerge out of those random initial connections. And this pattern is learning about oriented edge detectors. Inevitably, this is the kind of primary statistical structure that these kinds of heavy and learning mechanisms develop We've also introduced a, a topological constraint where nearby neurons tend to code similar things. So that's why you're seeing this pattern kind of develop and emerge here just as we're talking that has nearby neurons encoding similar orientations of these edges. Um, but all of these kinds of these dynamics are unfolding as the network is self-organizing through these really basic simple principles iterating over and over again on all these statistics of the real world. And so hopefully this lets you see that the networks actually can extract kind of the, the meaningful correlational statistics of the world, the, the structure that exists 
in these visual inputs um, and that this can produce a useful kind of encoding that captures the most important aspects of the statistical information that's present in the real world. In summary, self-organizing learning operates according to these principles, inhibitory competition, causing specialization, only some neurons get to learn, the other ones are not active, and according to this basic Hebbian principle, if you're not active, you don't learn, and therefore you don't get to optimize your response to those kinds of input patterns. You also get this rich, rich get richer dynamic. The neurons that win this inhibitory competition get to tune their synapses so that they do an even better job of detecting those same input patterns next time. But they also hopefully get more selective, so they get less likely to respond to input patterns that don't match those, and that's critical for preventing the rich from kind of becoming these hogs that take over the whole space. Um, this process of homeostasis, um, keeping things more evenly distributed, the BCM algorithm in particular does a very good job of this. And in, in kind of sociological terms, if we think about each neuron as, a, as an individual in society, um, where we do have these same kinds of problems of the rich, rich getting richer, as we know, the, the income inequality, tends to get higher and, and absent you know, different kinds of mechanisms to prevent that from happening. It's kind of a natural trajectory that, that takes place. You do end up with this kind of resource hogging. Uh, things don't get evenly distributed and that may actually, according to these kinds of computational models, not be a optimal way to run things. So you might actually be able to derive some interesting political and economic conclusions from models of the brain, who knows? Uh, but at least for sure in these models of the brain, we very, very much know that uh, you do need these kind of homeostatic negative feedback mechanisms to counteract these positive feedback loops and keep the, the neurons evenly distributed and covering the overall representational space. So lots of really interesting kind of emergent dynamics to think about and learn about in these models. Again, very simple initial principles give rise to emergent complexity, things that were not uh, really evident from the individual learning rules themselves, but produce these complex, uh, very beneficial uh, overall learning dynamics.